Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to another You Be The Behavior Consultant. Hope you're doing well. Oh, there I am, back there in my ear. Always got to check the audio, make sure we're sounding pretty good. And uh, yeah, we're back with another topic. It's another Monday morning. We're going to talk about states. And uh, I know that kind of sounds weird. We're not talking about, you know, countries, states, things like that. We're talking about um, kind of like the condition of the of the organism of the learner. So, hey, Al's here and Soraya's here. We got our regulars here. That's great. So we're gonna have some great discussion. We're gonna go ahead and jump into it so we don't delay here. So what are we doing here? We're doing You Be The Behavior Consultant, a live stream I try to do most Mondays. And how does it work for our new folks? I present a topic for discussion. I then have some questions to prompt our discussion a little bit further. We have some videos to look at this week and then of course we're going to recap it all at the end in case anybody joins us a little bit late in the discussion. I see Anne's here from Denmark as well. We, we like to have our international audience um, and uh, yeah so let's go ahead and jump into it. So we're going to talk about states and their impact on animal behavior and I have to say and this is kind of prompted by our tower talk and our really great discussion um, about your parrot behavior and so it, it really got me thinking and it got me exploring and I've been um, reading a new book which I'll, I'll share the title with you as we get going in this and also listening to uh, a really fascinating podcast about um, neurobiology, neuroscience that um, was featuring this particular author. And then there's also more stuff in that particular, um, well, I guess it's a podcast technically, but uh, they're, they're, you know, PhDs in neurobiology and neuroscience. But it was really interesting because, you know, they take a very sort of internal approach. And of course, behavior science that we tend to talk about in this particular live stream takes that behaviorist approach, which really comes from the external. So it's been really interesting listening to this material and trying to merge those two disciplines together. So it's really cool. And so we're going to try and merge those together in this live stream. And so Anne is, Anne's here and says, I love when you say it got me thinking. <laughs> we will all benefit from that. Well, hopefully, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying to merge our disciplines together and it works. You know, it's just, it's just, you kind of have to you have to put them together and um, and see how those two work together. And that's hopefully what we'll do today in today's live stream. So, of course, we have to ask questions like, what exactly are states? And, of course, um, the neurobiology field sort of has their description of them. And, um, and, and it makes sense. It'll make sense to you, too, and, and especially when we think of some examples of states. And we talk about them, too, in what we do as animal trainers. And then we definitely talk about how they impact behavior a lot. And I think, again, um, the example that Anne brought up in um, our Tower Talk, which, which um, we can talk about a little bit here in this live stream, will make sense for us as well. And then, and then I think the real big question is, how does this come into our animal training? How does it impact animal training? And how, how should we view them? How should we view states in, in that whole, I don't know, I, I don't want to give away too much too soon, but in how we address maybe a behavior problem or how does it influence what we're going to do in, um, in our training session in general, even if it's not a behavior problem, if we're trying to achieve a particular behavior goal. And, uh, and so, yeah, so that's kind of our, our launching off point <laughs> for our discussion today. So I don't know if anyone feels like jumping in on trying to address any of those questions or those prompts. You don't have to start at the, at the top there. Um, it might even be easier to, to jump in with a, an example of, of a state that maybe impacts, um, yeah, like aroused, playful, tired. Yeah, I think tired's a really easy one that we can relate to, that if, if your animal is tired, are they more likely to participate or less likely? Are they maybe more likely to give you an undesired response? Same thing with playful. Like if an, one of the things we were discussing in our, our, um, our tower talk is if an animal may be a little bit more highly aroused or playful, would they may be more likely to flip to an aggressive response that we don't want to see? So, um, so yeah, and, and again, you know, when we say we say some of these words, they might be 
kind of a label for something that maybe needs a little bit more defining and and that's where the scientists get a little bit more precise in their definitions and it's, I think it's okay if we're a little bit loose on it today because that's beyond the scope of a simple hour-long live stream but but we can use yeah, I think some of the words are you know maybe um you know, a little bit accurate, but some of them we might have to get, um, we would have to get more precise, but, but you guys are kind of on the right track there. Yeah. So things like, like aroused, playful, tired work as, as, um, as an example of maybe a description of a state that could impact what might happen with the animal in the training session. You guys have some other thoughts on that? Um, relaxed. Yeah. Focused. Yeah. I think those are good, good examples. Any, any other things that might uh, might come to mind for you? And then imagine trying to relate this to what's happening neuro in, the, in, in neurons in the brain. <laughs> Distracted? <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine even trying to, to you know, identify specific neurons. Um, in the book I'm reading, um, engaged. Yeah, in, in the book I'm reading, literally all that's been done so far in the scientific community is like to identify six neurons in a in a fruit fly <laughs> that they are pretty confident um, are associated with aggressive responses. <laughs> <laughs> and they're and they're calling that state anger, you know, because aggressive responses, as they were pointing out, can be completely different, right? You know, like you guys know this, that, you know, a lunge, a bite are all different behaviors, but is that a state, right? So they're saying those are aggressive behaviors, not necessarily a state, a state. And so they were calling anger the state as opposed to aggression. Um, and that may be controlled by different pathways in the brain, whereas um, actual anger, they were able to identify six neurons in a very specific species, you know, in a fruit fly um, that's genetically altered so that they, they can, uh, um, you know, find those neurons. It's really fascinating reading. Uh, so fearful. Um, so like you're saying, like a flight or fight response. Yeah. And it's even like, yeah. And, and in the book, they're even talking about it's not even necessarily just controlled by you know, like there was that talk about the amygdala and stuff like that. There's also hypothalamus um, uh, structures that are involved. It's it's a really, really fascinating. But to, to be able to take take it down to six neurons in a particular species, and that's the fly, and obviously they haven't even been able to, uh, you know, get to that kind of level in mammalian species because there's, too many, there's far more neurons than that. Um, and these are sort of the advances they're saying that are happening in neurobiology because of, of what they're doing with the science. So it's not just like this electrochemical or electrostimulation. They now are doing this kind of thing where they, they use, um, I, I believe they were calling opt, optogenetics, where they basically genetically encode neurons that they can, um, they can use like a laser to light up the neuron because it's got a gene in it that lights up crazy really fascinating stuff so it's called nature of the beast is the book if you want to read it but again you have to read it with a, with critical thinking um, from a behavior standpoint to to get around some things so um so anyway so uh uh so uh okay so moving on here to what we were talking about uh to do it with um memories happy ones and mice uh, oh they do it with memories happy ones and mice yeah so more more on on this uh kind of stuff trying to locate these points in the in the brain so depressed could depressed be a state as al is saying yeah and uh, and again you know trying to uh um pinpoint where where the neurons might be in the brain where some of these things might i guess technically originate and I don't want well, I shouldn't say originate I don't want to say originate where they um they are at least mapping them put it that way um and I think this is I, I you know he hasn't mentioned pants pants up yet so I don't know um it's because I haven't finished the book so I don't know how far or, or what the overlap there I'm not sure the mechanisms that pants up used to measure his his locations uh hungry yeah I think hungry and sleepy are good ones as far as states and he mentions that um 
a lot in the book, and we're and I want to talk about um, hunger a little bit as well as we move on here. Um, yeah, so let's let's go into a little bit of a definition here. So um, so from that neuro neurobiological approach, they are processes or conditions that can be observed in the brain, and um, and again, you know, the science is still got a ways to go before they can really make the leap to what is actually happening in mammalian species. Um, you know, they've done stuff in mice and, and um, some rats and a little bit in cats, but, but they, you know, we're extrapolating if we go to, you know, more complex species. Uh, well, and mice are pretty complex and so are cats, but, but we can't say, you know, we know this is what's happening in humans. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Soraya's put the, um, the, uh, the book in the chat there so you guys can find it. And, um, and, uh, and so it impacts behavior. It changes the input to output in terms of what the animal may emit as a behavior. But there's more to this, and we're going to get into this. There, and the other thing I think that's really important that they mentioned is that there's, it's, but there's dimensions. It's not just, you know, as you guys would uh, certainly be able to attest, you're not just hungry, right? Um, there can be all sorts of dimensions to that you know there might be an initial arousal stage that can change there could be intensity there could be and valence is a tough word for me because we've talked about this with the five domains it, it's very subjective you know in terms of good or bad um, but I think here's a really interesting thing there can be persistence um, beyond the stimulus that that um, you know, that, 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 uh, may have evoked the response or that, that evoked that neuron, neuron activity initially. And, um, and so I think the really good example they gave is like, let's say, um, there was an aggressive response or even a fear response. And now the stimulus that was a part of that in which the behavior was, was emitted is now removed that, that fear response or that fear emotion or that that um, anger emotion may persist even though the stimulus has been removed and I, so I think that's really interesting and they show that the the neuron activity is still lit up in the brain even though that stimulus has been removed that that can happen and I think you know if we were to reflect on our own experience we probably can say we feel those emotions even after the stimulus is removed um, but I also think that's interesting to explore because when you think about covert behavior like thoughts um, that you know thought thought is a covert behavior but that does continue and I wonder if that's the stimulus that continues that neural activity I don't know just that was just a thought I had um, and then um, and then the other thing that they mentioned is generalization and that that um, that it can transfer to other conditions so like say you are feeling tired and then um, whatever environment you're in right now and you're feeling tired and then you move to another space and that tiredness is still happening within your body and so whatever environmental conditions are there um, you might still carry that tiredness with you and so whatever stimuli are in that environment you may be more likely to respond to those those stimuli just as you would in another environment. Um, how about props and other parts of the occasion? Um, so, so other thing. Mm, I just purchased the book. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna have to read that. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm still I'm halfway through, so there's more to read there. Um, uh, in other words, the state is fluid and dynamic is basically what I'm trying to point point out um, there. So uh, so there's it's it's not going to be you're just hungry or you're just tired. It, it will change um, depending on a lot of conditions. Uh, and uh, Carolina has some topics on that, too. Uh, got you. Got you. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. Um, well, and I think this is a relatively new book, so it may have new emerging information. Uh, I think some of the research that he's done is a little bit, um, you know, uh, uh, recent. So I don't know. You guys will, since, since, uh, since Gus, you just purchased it, maybe you can check the publication date on it. So let's talk about some of those examples. So you guys mentioned a bunch of these, um, hunger, thirst, sleep. 
Um, emotions you might be considered. Um, uh, oh yeah, Audible. I did Audible too. <laughs> I like Audible books. Um, and uh, and let's see. Um, yeah, so emotions could be like a considered a um, a state, emotional state. 2022. Yeah, so it is pretty recent. Recent. And then I put in. Um, reproductive hormone amplification because um that that was kind of the topic we were talking about in our tower talk how how um we tend to think of that as as a condition or a state and um and that is actually kind of a feature in this book because of the fact that uh it seems that aggress aggressive responses and um sexual behavior that's one of the things that he talks a lot about in this book is how um, some of that neuron activity seems to be in the same region. Um, they seem to be very close to one another. So the stimulation of those two things seems to happen um, very easily, like a little bit of a spillover. And so that's kind of what they're exploring is, you know, how aggress aggression and sexual slash courtship behavior um, seem to be sometimes very closely tied together. Uh, so that's kind of how it went down that pathway. And that was, I think, sort of what prompted me to look at this because of our discussions about about um, parrots and their, when they're in this reproductive state, how they are, can be very easily triggered to, um, to demonstrate some aggressive responses. So, but one of the things I think is really interesting that they were talking about with, with, uh, um, some of these states is that some of them are easily turned off with a change in conditions. So uh, that idea that homeostasis is important. So for example, with hunger and thirst. So if you eat something, you're like, ah, oh, okay, I'm done. Yeah. And others will persist like we talked about with, with um, the uh, potential fear response or that or an aggressive response. So for example, food and water will turn off, but fear may persist even after the aversive stimulus is removed. And some are um, homeostatic, like I said. Um, right, and so um, so Chris is asking about the, the um, contingency um, descriptors and emotions. So we're gonna get into that. So I'm glad that you brought that up because that part I think is not, this is one of the things where I said we, we're going to take a little bit of a behaviorist approach. So I don't think that they're necessarily conflicting. I think you will find in the book there is there is a little bit of, I think they kind of flip back and forth between that um, the environment impacts behavior and that behavior comes from the starting point of the brain. So so that's why I was going to say when you read the book, you're going to have to read with a little bit of a behaviorist perspective and remember that. But we're going to talk about that today. So don't so don't uh, don't fret. <laughs> so actually, that's a good that's a good point or a good a good uh, stopping point to look at a video. So let's let's take a look at, you know, this right here. Exactly how it feels in the radio without a watch. <laughs> Yeah, you guys are right. So that is a that was at one of the facilities where I consult, and um, so male rhino and trying to to mate with a rock, and uh, great example that you don't need a whole set of a female; you can just get a few a few props. Yeah, but you know, I think kind of our inclination 
you know, might be to interpret that as, well, he's, you know, his hormones are raging. And so he's, you know, he's, uh, he's gonna, you know, that's, that's the cause of his behavior, sort of an internal state is the cause of his behavior. And, um, and I'm going to give you another example. Um, let's, let's look at another one similar to that. think it started all over again. <laughs> so when you look at those, it's kind of easy to, <laughs> yeah, tortoises are very persistent, aren't they? Yeah, so, so if we look at those, it's very easy to just kind of say, to, you know, blame it on the internal state of the animal, right? And um, so, so maybe I'll just kind of let that I'll let you think about that for for now, and um, keep that keep that in mind. And I would say that's sort of where the book comes from. Um, there is a book, The Case Against Reality, where they talk about very si similar situations. You don't need reality just enough to trick your brain. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's kind of what the book is saying. They're basically saying we're gonna shoot. A little charge into your brain an, an electrical stimulation or a light stimulation and then you'll do that behavior but but keep that in mind okay just keep that in mind for now I'm gonna, I'm gonna we're gonna slowly reveal some things here um, uh, let me, let's see let's let's go on to the next slide and then uh, and then we'll come back to that thought so just let you kind of think about what you saw there and then we'll talk a little bit about this valence thing, um, that the the level or value can change, that the experience may be appetitive or or you know aversive, meaning that maybe that experience is good or bad. And again, you know that's kind of subjective. How do you how do you measure that? Um, and um, but but again, you know, we can say that um, the way that they see it in the brain is that the hunger neuron circuitry is lighting up as it becomes more aversive. You know, so this is what they can see. We, of course, you know, without, you know, being able to look at the brain, we have to look at behavior. Um, it be, uh, the hunger circuitry is lighting up as the condition becomes more aversive. And as the animal eats something, it, that area is, is calming down. It's not so lit up. Um, uh, and the other thing that I think is really interesting, which I mentioned earlier, is that, that the neurobiology for an aver observed aggressive response will look different. So like we were saying that you can't just say all aggressive responses are the same. So a predatory attack looks different as far as the neurons firing and the circuitry that's being used versus a fear defensive attack. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, and, uh, and so that makes me think about, I have this little video of some orangutans when I was in Borneo that are, you know, kind of play, fly, play fighting and it's two males. And even though it, you know, it kind of looks a little rough. I imagine that kind of play fighting then would look very different in the brain if they were actually really attacking fighting. So not her. She's okay, the, she, it's going to come up in a bit here. She's just playing. Okay. It's these two males.
And and um, the author found that also with the flies, at least, that um, the so-called aggression or anger um, get was very different in males and, f and females. So that was also, you'll find that interesting, whoever ends up buying that book and reading it. And then, of course, this is something you guys already know from experience. Even if the state is very lit up, so to speak, and very prepared to respond, the right stimulus must be present for the behavior to be emitted, right? So we've, we talked about this in our Tower Talk, so that even though an animal might be like hormonally prepared, there has to be a stimulus present in order for the animal to do the behavior. So like you think about this animal may be hungry, but if there's no thing there for it to eat, it's not going to just attack, right? It's, it's not, you know, and so that they showed that a lot, you know, that, um, you know, they, an, a, a mouse may be ready to attack something, but if there's nothing for it to attack, it won't just attack it into the air. It has to attack, it has, there has to be a target for it to attack. And, um, and so I have this video with this goat that I want to show you. And I think what's really interesting is also that the, um, you know, this, this goat isn't like all fired up. And I think that's another thing to think about. I think when we think about states, we have a tendency to think of, um, you know, highly aroused or, or really, really tired. But to me, this is more about the stimulus is really, really important for an animal to do um, a behavior uh, or, you know, or some, some response. So, so I want you to look at the fact that the goat is actually quite focused and relaxed and then a stimulus enters its space and that's when it does um, a response. <laughs> Oh, gotta get the little one. Is he still trying to get your arm? So a couple comments. Uh, in the first video, there was more going on. The tortoise seemed to be pretty focused on one thing. But in both the rhino and the tortoise thing, there had to be the stimulus of a rock for the rhino and another tortoise for, for, the, um, for the tortoise. Um, and Soraya says, aren't more dimorphic species more sexually competitive aggressions and more hormonal differences between the sexes? Uh, I don't know, I, you know, I don't know enough about all the different species. <laughs> I'm just repeating what that um, particular scientist was able to show with, at least with fr fruit flies. <laughs> yeah, and I, I don't think enough experiments have been done with, um, you know, uh, you know, to be able to, you know, confidently say that, you know, he's been able to show that with the, the neurons, at least on the, neur on the neuron level with those fruit flies. So I'd be tough, it'd be a stretch to be able to make a statement like that for, um, for everything at this state, I think. I think there, you know, there, there is a lot more research to go, but it's really fascinating what he's finding out so far. So now taking all this information, let's go back to some of the questions you guys had about, you know, how does this fit into that behavior analytic approach, a behaviorist approach? Because this is really cool information. Um, and, uh, and, but it's not, it's not, you know, competitive with a behaviorist approach. I think it just, there's just a, maybe a little twist on it. We want it, we want to take a look at, because I think what, what you'll find in the book is they're sort of saying behavior starts here. It starts here, but what, you know, a behaviorist would say is that it starts from outside. And, um, and so what we might think about a state as is that a state might be described as maybe a setting event or antecedents or motivating operations. We also might think of them as outcomes of contingencies, which ties into what um, Gus and uh, Chris were saying. And so for us, I don't think a state would be the cause of the behavior. It's not necessarily the starting point, but it's, but it's in there. 
it's part of it's part of this loop of behavior that's happening. And so we're going to take a look at this loop and see where a state might play into this this whole loop of behavior that's happening. Because even when you think about what this researcher is talking about, um, the um, the they're still stimulating the brain in order to get those neurons to fire. So something's happening outside the body that caused those neurons to fire. Um, potenti potentiating variables. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So so let's take a look at this. Um, and and Soraya, maybe what I'm talking about is going to help um, answer your question there. So let's look at this. So we've got, um, you know, this is kind of behavior as a loop and sort of, you know, very very simplified. So we've got environmental conditions change, and that may cause the state to change, the state of the animal. And then we've got some stimul stimuli are introduced, and even and I could even put another state change after the stimuli, to be quite honest. Um, but these stimuli are introduced, and that you know, imp you know this, uh, and then this causes some sort of behavior to be evoked, and then that could create some outcome, some consequence, which could also include some state changes. Maybe it impacts this original state that's in blue, but it could also include some emotions that are, that are um, part of that outcome. And then what could happen is that this whole thing starts all over again. Maybe those outcomes, including those state, state changes, prepare the animal for even more behavior, or maybe the animal returns to homeostasis and everything is kind of chill for a while until the environmental conditions change again. And then the state changes again, and then everything repeats itself. So it's really just a continuous loop of, ver of, um, of behavior, so to speak. And so like I was saying, even in the lab, those neurons didn't start firing you know spontaneously something something made those neurons fire and and so what made those neurons fire in the lab was that the scientists you know did some sort of whether they used the laser beam of light that made the genetically altered um, uh, neurons fire or they used an electronic stimulation that caused those to try or that trigger that was the environmental change that caused the state change in the animal that then made them respond to the stimuli of maybe an introduced fruit fly or an introduced mouse that then made behavior um, become, uh, uh, you know, happen and, and then you know, led to whatever changes they were trying to study. So there was still an environmental change. It didn't start with a state change. So that's, that's how we can tie it into what that scientist is saying at, from a behaviorist perspective. Okay, so now if you want, we can look at some, you know, real life examples on this. Does that, is that hopefully, well, it, we'll see if this helps make more sense for you with some real life examples. So let's say we've got an animal that's um, been, haven't, hasn't eaten for a while. And so time is passing. So the conditions are food deprivation. And so now hunger is increasing. This is our state change. The animal's getting hungrier and hungrier. But if there's no food to eat, you know, or, you know, the conditions aren't available for the animal to do any behavior to acquire food, you know, there's, the state, you know, doesn't necessarily change, right? But now a prey item appears, you know, let's say that, you know, that little bee eater is, is there and oh my God, a, a, a bug flies by. And so the bee eater goes, oh, well, I'm going to go catch that. It flies, it catches it, it eats. And now it starts to feel satiety. So the state changes, the condition changes. And, it, and then maybe no more behavior is evoked because um, it gets to sati satiety. So it gets to a homeostasis. And so then it's just going to wait until conditions change again. As time passes, food deprivation sits, sit, um, starts to occur. And then the state is going to change again. We get increased hunger. And then again, we'd have to have those conditions where where um, the stimuli are available and then the animal might do behavior again. So um, we could look at another one. What about temperature changes? Which speaking of which now I'm getting hot. Oh, 
changes because I moved around. <laughs> Temperature increases, animal gets hot, maybe shade is available. So the animal moves into the change, uh, shade and temperature regu regulation is achieved. Maybe temperature drops, animal gets cold, sun comes out. So the animal moves into a sun, a sun patch and temperature regulation is achieved. So now let's take um, one of these uh, hormone examples. So when we were talking about the parrot, we were talking about Maybe um, a rich and abundant diet is provided. Maybe a nest site is provided. Maybe courtship and sexual behaviors are reinforced by a mate or a perceived mate. And maybe this leads to reproductive hormone amplification. So now we've got a state. And, and in this particular state, we've identified that, in parrots at least, it makes... This is kind of like that um, when we were saying about the, the hunger neuron being lit up. It makes this animal more likely to respond to certain environmental stimuli. And so let's say an intruder appears in its environment, in its um, ter perceived territory. And so it makes it more likely that the animal's going to bite or, lun or lunge. So it evokes that behavior. So biting, let's say biting occurs and then the outcome of that biting behavior is that the animal gets distance from that aversive stimulus, but it also may produce some emotional responses, some emotional behavior or emotions. That, so that's another state. So now we've got two states. We still got the hormone amplification state. We also got some emotional responses, some emotional behavior and emotion state. And what I think is probably going on here is both of these states continue for, the, I would say the hormone amplification continues beyond this loop and maybe this emotion state continues for a little while longer after the behavior was evoked. And depending on what happens next, say some more environmental stimuli um, happen, you could get more behavior um, that you may not want to see, uh, you know, just depending on what happens next. So, so I think, um, you know, this kind of cycle can set you up for, for lots of undesired responses. And, uh, and so it could be that what's happening in the brain is that, 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 you know, you've got several things that are all lit up there and some are going well beyond what just happened in that particular moment in which an undesired behavior was emitted. Um, and so it's, it's interesting to think about, right? And it's obviously, this is really simplifying it down, but I'm sure it's far more complex than, than what I've, I've given you here. <laughs> but I'm trying to help give you a little visual of what might be happening there. So then it kind of leads us to, well, what can we do? <laughs> and I think it's not going to sound so unfamiliar to you all. I think what we can think about is we can view. <laughs> okay, so dog says, or, or, or dog lab, <laughs> Gus says, I agree. I think, um, I think what we do is we view these states as we often have um, as antecedent conditions, right? And, um, and we can also view them as outcomes as well. So when we view them as antecedent conditions, we can focus on changing the environment to help change the states. So like when we were talking about um, the parrot, you know, is there anything we can do to help make it less likely that an animal will go into a reproductive state? And, um, and so, you know, I showed you the, the rhino situation. I mean, that wasn't necessarily a problem because they want to breed rhinos. Some places they have a hard time getting rhinos to breed. <laughs> so, um, so they're often trying to figure out ways to make it more likely that a rhino will breed. Um, and I'm going to just show you this video of this Turaco.
you know, that bird was part of a, um, a show that we did at a facility. And a lot of people thought that behavior was really fun. But unfortunately, reinforcing that behavior was similar to the challenges we would have, you, you know, you can have with a parrot. If we reinforce that behavior, he, he was more likely to start forming really strong mate-like bonds with specific individuals that would cause him to be more likely uh, to um, emit aggressive responses towards other people. So we had to be really careful to not encourage that vocalization and that, that kind of you know courtship-like displays with people. So, you know, we try not to engage in those types of behaviors and reinforcing courtship. Yeah, like the, like the kookaburra territorial calling. Yeah, and sometimes, um, yeah, so, so yeah, we have to be careful about those things. We have to think about what are we reinforcing. And then I think also, um, as we talked about with the um, contingencies as, um, as descriptors of emotions and emotional behavior, we can think about, can we focus on addressing the contingencies to change outcomes if they're, if they're producing undesired responses or undesired states? So when we think about like, oh, that biting got, got distance, then we can think about, well, let's teach a different response that will give that animal distance. So we start focusing on how can we teach um, the desired outcome so that we can teach the right, so that hopefully we get to the emotional state that we want. So, so I think, and when, of course, we can also do both. So I think these are, these are practices that I think are, um, for the most part, pretty familiar to us already. Well, maybe, maybe not so much the, the contingency one. I think that's kind of new to some people. But the focusing on our antecedent conditions and focusing on our outcomes are really uh, are really kind of tools that that are in our toolbox already. But I think again, it brings us back to we're focusing on the environment as opposed to looking at it's within the animal, it's a problem within the animal, it's you know as as Joe Lang would put it, um, pathological. Um, so if we if we see that as pathological, then it puts us in that place that we can't fix it. You know, that he's hormonal, he's, you know, he's aggressive, he's, uh, you know, he's just a fearful animal. But again, if we go back to, you know, the environment is contributing to this, the contingencies are contributing to this, how can I address those things? Then, um, then hopefully we can uh, get back on track, right? Even if there is neurobiology that's involved. <laughs> Although it's still fascinating, right? I think it's still really cool to look at. Okay, hopefully that made a little bit of sense there. Um, and again, I do encourage you reading the book because I think it's really fascinating um, just to see what, what we're discovering. And, it, and it's more, you know, definitely more than, uh, you know, where we've been in the past from, from what he's getting and some really cool technology that's helping, helping us get there. Um, but again, I encourage you to think about, you know, keep your behaviorist hat on as you're reading it. Um, Cause every once in a while you'll, you'll hear, you know, you'll read something that's, that's basically saying behavior starts from the brain. But again, I just always go back to, but you know, you stimulated the brain in order to get that. So it still came from the outside, <laughs> which is fine. It's just, it's just, um, you know, kind of, kind of keeping that little mindset in there. So to kind of recap this, um, various states or condition conditions within the animal um, um, are often attributed for the cause of behavior. And as Soraya says, he goes the mentalistic route. Um, well, I think he just kind of flip flops a little bit because he does certainly sometimes talk about external stimuli and how they are impacting it. I think it's just a little bit of semantics, um, a little bit of language uh, things. So, um, but, uh, but, you know, you'll catch it. You'll catch it. It's fine. Um, discoveries in, neuros in neuroscience is identifying, or I should say are identifying, the mechanisms and pathways for various states, especially behaviors associated with aggression and fear. However, these behaviors aren't spontaneously emitted, right? Envir environmental stimuli are still part of the process, even if it's electrical or chemical stimulation to that part of the brain. Therefore, the state is still part of the behavior loop the, and one that arises due to antecedent conditions. The state itself can then control 
contribute to the antecedent conditions, making the animal more likely to respond to the stimuli that evoke behavior. This in turn can lead to more states as outcomes, such as emotional states that can persist even after stimuli are gone, which I think is really cool. Um, states that are not homeostatic may also persist, creating antecedent conditions for even more behavior. <laughs> Um, changing states, therefore, is much like what we do with our other behavior goals. Focus on changing the antecedents that give rise to those states and or addressing the contingencies that produce those outcomes, you know, which could be states if undesired. Um, so uh, so Cynthia is um, asking if learned helplessness is a state. I, I think you could label that a state. I think that that would be a, um, you know, a thing that you could label as a state as well, possibly. I think there's a lot of things that we could label as state. It's just sort of operationalizing it. <laughs> I mean, that's really all we're doing, to be honest. We're just kind of giving labels to things that we observe. Um, but, but I will say, like, he, you know, in the book, he talks about a sort of primitive emotions, which is kind of, I think, like what Panksepp did, that there's certain things that, you know, seem to be sort of universal in terms of um, responses. Yeah, sort of translating, yeah. 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 So interesting stuff, isn't it? <laughs> but, you know, I, like I said, it all for me, it all kind of is generated from uh, some of the discussions we all have together, which, you know, sends you down a pathway of of uh, kind of getting into getting into it a little bit deeper, which obviously other people are interested in, too. Also, because some of these things seem to have a little bit of overlap and um you know, I think for the neurobiologist, you know, I, I think what brought me to this particular um, researcher is his work in, in how, um, you know, sexual behavior and aggression are seem to be very tied together for for um, animals and humans. And uh, um, and so that's what he was exploring. And and so, you know, that I thought was really interesting and fascinating and. And so they're, they're kind of looking for, you know, what are these close together in the brain? You know, are these neurons near each other? Are they triggering each other in different ways? And so, you know, that's kind of fascinating stuff. You know, I mean, I obviously, um, you know, we tend not to go that, that far into that. We tend to look at everything outside saying we can't know these private events. And these guys are kind of saying, well, can we? You know, can we find out what's happening inside there? So, so kind of cool. Kind of cool. Anyway, um, so if you want a few more resources, um, there is this course on creating motivation. It's super old in terms of the technology, but the information is still pretty good. Um, I was looking at it before I put it in here. And like one of the things that I really like in it is um, there is a little section in there about ways that we can sort of, quote, measure motivation in our little world <laughs> um, by, you know, whether it's operationally or what we can look at to sort of uh, figure that out. And then um, and then we did do a, uh, a a live stream on motivating operations that has a lot of overlap with what we discussed today. That was pretty good. Uh, and then I know a bunch of you um, are participating in the behavior challenge. And you noticed I opened up the Facebook group and oh my gosh, what a what a challenge to get people into the Facebook group. Facebook has not made this easy. Um, <coughs> so if you... Um, are trying to get the link, please, please keep keep emailing me. I did actually, through Facebook, send an email to each and every single one of you with a fresh link, but I don't know if anybody got it. Um, I had to do that by hand, and I literally sent 300 emails out to each and every single one of you yesterday. Um, so please look for that email if you are um, a part of that. So that is very frustrating because I see that um, clearly you all have not received that or you all would be in the in the Facebook group now and you're not because um, I'm still getting emails saying send me a fresh link so uh, so yeah <laughs> I see Chris is in there yeah um, so uh, yeah if you if you end up hearing this live stream look there I, I I'm trying I'm trying to get you in there <laughs> please please keep reaching out I will get you in there one way or another I tried to reach out to Facebook but they are notorious for not having a way to ask them any questions. So um, it's not, that's the, that's, I knew that part was going to be the hardest part. <laughs> I'm not a fan of having to, you know, try to use their system, but 
but we'll get you in there one way or another. <laughs> uh, and then just a reminder that um, in two weeks, we do our, our goats on emotions. So this is going to be super cool. And Anna Linehan is just, you know, a uh, really awesome human being and presenter. And uh, you guys are going to love her just like you love Jonathan. So so I really encourage you to sign up for this one to be there for the live so you can ask your questions. And um, dun, 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 I've got another goats lecture on deck. Look at this one. We're going to talk about training cockroaches. <laughs> Christopher Varnon um, is another professor who uses cockroaches as a model to help teach his students. And so he's going to give us a lecture on that. That one's in March. So we've got a little while on that one, but just giving you an early heads up so you can mark your calendars and, um, and also has worked with honeybees and horses. So he is um, available for us in March. And then uh, here is a citation for this particular talk today. And if you are not a member, which, you know, is a great way to get in on these GOATS lectures um, as part of your membership, you can always join us. Come to AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com. So, um, so there you go. And I think that is it for today. <laughs> another topic another interesting topic yep and uh just some comments here oh Soraya's gonna get some roaches yeah and these um I think he works with uh orange-headed roaches are the ones that he um he he works with and I saw his lecture at um the Association for Behavior Analysis International last year and um it was really cool yeah he and he has some really uh if he, if he does the same lecture he has some great um, suggestions and setups for how to train them so hopefully he'll share those with you and and uh, tell you how to how to get it all done <laughs> oh and and Gus has some roaches that are not very well trained just some house house pets the kind that hang out on their own <laughs> and can't do the challenge because you're gone uh, this this week but the next one yeah I've already got an idea for the next one I'm not going to tell you I mean we have the fear one coming up in April, um, but that uh, that's a that's a 30-day challenge. But I have another five-day challenge already um, in mind, but I'm not going to announce what it is just yet. Uh, but I'm excited about that that one too. I think that one will be a fun one that you will enjoy as well. Um, just want to get 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 this one going first and see see how it goes, and hopefully we'll we'll uh, be able to iron out any little bumps. Um, <laughs> Cynthia says my hubby would draw the line at roaches as residents <laughs> and training subjects. Oh, I don't know. Who knows? You may get inspired after you watch that presentation. So um, it, was a good, it was a good lecture at, at the conference. So I have a feeling people will enjoy this one. It was, it was very cool, um, the things that they were accomplishing. You know, so instead of, you know, chicken, chicken labs and chicken workshops, he basically does a roach roach labs and roach workshops for his students and they 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 you know really uh test the um you know the uh the learning processes and learn about the learning processes using using roaches as the model pretty cool huh <laughs> All right, guys. Well, uh, hopefully you enjoyed that topic, gave you some food for thought. Maybe, you know, go back and look at those uh, graphics to, you know, kind of seal the, the whole concepts in there. Um, and let's see, we're here next week as well. And we'll have a Tower Talk next week as well, even though we... Um, we'll be doing the, the challenge too. We'll be doing the behavior challenge. So, so it's going to be a very exciting week next week. I'm, and we've already got people that have been um, sharing the animals that they're going to be training. We've got such cool species already. We've got, um, you know, we have lots of people working with dogs. Chris is working with her horse. We've got, um, someone's going to work with a taper, a pelican, um, bear. Uh, what else was in there that was unusual? Um, trying to think. Oh, cats. Someone's going to work with a domestic cat. Yeah. So, so we've got some, uh, interesting species that are going to be in the challenge. So it's going to be really fun to see what people can accomplish. And that's, that's without me having been able to get all the participants in the group just yet. So, so I can't even imagine all the different species that we're going to see working on the challenge. So you can still, you can still, uh, join if you want to, um, 
uh, we still got, you know, just go to behaviorchallenge.com and, and sign up. Oh yeah, pig, a, a pig was in there too. Yeah, there's gonna be some really fun ones. So I'm really excited to see how this goes. Be a great, great uh, learning opportunity for all of us to help uh, fine tune this shaping plan and make it really, really accessible and user-friendly for everybody. And yeah, so big fun. All right, guys, uh, I think we are, I don't, yeah, I don't think we can probably, well, I don't know, maybe somebody could figure out how to do it with a cockroach, we'll find out. <laughs> All right, guys, I think uh, that's it for today, and um, I will look forward to seeing you next week and uh, seeing you in the challenge. All right, take care and have a good day. Bye.